Hey, this is Chris with uh, the Temple Guardian YouTube channel, and as promised, I'm continuing these series of videos in the aviation series. Um, I'm joined today with my friend Kathy Kloss. Um, I want to tell you about her, and I'm really psyched because she's agreed to do my first interview for this series of videos. So first off, uh, Kathy is a personal friend. We met each other back in February or March of this year. Uh, she's a mother of five, very successful children. She's a business owner. She's a commercial pilot uh, with single and multi-engine ratings, and she is uh, instrument rated. Uh, she owns the Skydive School, the jumping place here in Statesboro, Georgia. Um, Kathy and I have flown together in the Twin Cessna 340, and also uh, Kathy trained me to fly jump planes for her, a couple of 182s here. Kathy, thank you for uh, doing this interview. Thank you. I appreciate it. And um, so I just wanted to go after people who are passionate in the field, uh, professionals, and find out, you know, we all kind of have our different niche within aviation, and you definitely have yours with the skydive school. So tell me how you got into this. How did you get started? How did you develop a uh, love for flying and skydiving? Um, I was attending, actually my father gave me my first flight when I was 16 years old. I kind of put flying on hold. You have things that you have to do. You have to go to college. I was at the University of South Florida, and they had a high adventure club, and my young brother had joined. He was also at USF. He joined the USF Skydiving Club, decided the gear was not safe enough yet, said we're not going to skydive. So about a year later, the gear had made some improvements, and he started skydiving, and I quickly followed. This is your brother? Yeah. And what is USF? Uh, University of South Florida. University uh, of South Florida. Yeah. Uh, two of my children. And how old was he? Um, Ed was early 20s. And um, you were? About the same. We were, there was a two-year difference between the two of us. And you were younger. Um, everybody thinks I'm the younger one, but um, I'm actually the older sibling. So he got into it first? Yes. And he so he did not feel comfortable with the equipment? Uh, the equipment was pretty scary. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was pretty wild stuff. Uh, a good friend of mine, Judy Redvers, has uh, some old black and white photos of her with equipment that is down to her knees. Uh, she's a very small girl, and the equipment back then did not even fit women. The first parachute that I ever flew was 288 square feet. And I'm about 118 pounds on a good day. So. And what year was this? Um, I made my first skydive in 1985. Wow. Um, my younger brother had started, I think, the year before that. And then the really cool thing is when when somebody else brings you into something, if you can pay them back a little later on. Um, I uh, was very instrumental in him getting advanced instructional ratings, and then he has come and he's worked with my skydiving center. Wow. So it goes full circle. It does. That's cool. It, it always does. So you were skydiving in college, mm -hmm. and um, were you flying then, or just skydiving? I was just skydiving. I could not afford to fly. I, uh, most of my adult life, I was uh, kind of busy raising children. And, so you and have five. I do have five. Uh, very, very, very lucky with my children. I do believe that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. If you invest in your children now, later on, they'll invite you to go snowboarding with them. Like, they, they are everything children are everything. They inspire you. They keep you running first thing in the morning. If your children see that you're getting up and you're going and you're running miles, they know that's what they come from. If they see that you're flying airplanes, they know that, that that's the expectation. So. Cool. And I forgot to mention in the intro, Kathy's also a marathoner. Seven? Seven marathons. Seven marathons. Wow. In my free time. And what, in, in your first marathon, you ran, what, with no training? So? Uh, no training. Don't, <laughs> don't do that. Uh, it it uh, does things physiologically that we're not going to discuss here. Um, you definitely do not want to run a marathon cold. They, uh, you, you do want to train for them. Um, yeah, but my first marathon time was uh, just over, was almost 300, 3 hours, 53 minutes, just under 3 hours, 53 That's minutes. That's nuts. I trained like a dog for my first one and crashed and burned and came in at like 4.15. 415 is a perfectly respectable, <laughs> uh, more than respectable. That's a, that's a solid marathon time. I think President Bush was at like five hours and 25 minutes or something. And you know what? Just, Bush Senior? Bush junior. No, that was Junior. Junior Bush. Pretty sure that was Junior. Yeah. Well, I've improved on my marathon time since then. Look at your build. But, you're, uh, you're, you have such an advantage. So what was your last marathon? Uh, the most recent one was probably like three, just over three and a half, right at three and a, uh, three and a half hours. That's awesome. Yeah, I was feeling pretty
pretty good about it. That's awesome. Yeah, that was a good one. Um, let's see, that would have been 2013, March. So it's been a while. Now, I have done a 50K since then. Um, I can't even imagine. But I haven't done a marathon this year. Yeah. You seriously? Whoa. Wow. Yeah, that was. Um, how, many, how many hours is a 50K? It depends on, like, a lot of different variables, like the temperature, the terrain. So this was a really slow one. It was like 100 degrees at the start. I did the um, the Mad Marsh 50K over in Buford. We're getting off on a running tangent. Oh, I'm so, sorry. Um, it's so easy to do that with me. Yeah, um, me too. Running's uh, kind of another passion. We should probably edit that out. I don't no, know. no, we don't edit. No, um, no editing? I don't edit. Um, but I was talking in my last video about passion. So you had to Passion. I mean, we were passionate about running. We're passionate about flying. Uh, passionate about uh, jumping out of airplanes. So, so you were uh, into skydiving before you were into flying. But tell me how you got into flying. Um, okay, so I'm. I've been. I spent most of my life running a uh, packing service. We packed parachutes. I had to make money. Um, single parenting. Uh, I had to do something to earn an income, and I did not want to leave my children at home. And the skydiving community. Brings, it doesn't take a village, it takes a skydiving center to raise these children. I, I, the long list of people that I would have to thank for how successful that we'd be here all day. Um, and, and I have to bite my tongue because I, I want to start doing that. I want to thank all those people that totally raised these children. So um, these people would actually allow me to pack parachutes with a child on my back. So I designed a special harness because the very first time I tried to do this, the baby carriers, which were in the front, this one was in the back, and I went to bend over and, and uh, had to catch the child. Um, kind of went, that isn't going to work. So we designed a harness, and I was able to pack parachutes, and I found out that I could pack as many parachutes as most men while carrying a child. So consequently, if you're the one that does the most and fights the hardest, you become the one who's controlling the business. Wow. Um, with that, I, you have to take care of your people. You have to consider your people, and you. I think it helps if you absolutely love the people that work with you. So I uh, gave up. I was managing convenience stores after college, and I was skydiving, and I was scuba diving, and doing you know just what typically single parents run around doing, right? And I uh, decided that I was going to give up real world, and I was going to open up my own business, but it was just going to be me. I wasn't going to do anything else. Um, no, no time clocks, no schedules. Uh, you fast forward about three years later, we have 32 people working for the company. We're in three different states, and I'm running um, probably the largest packing service in the country, and I don't think that anyone would refute that. Wow. I was complaining once about glass ceilings, how women still have glass ceilings, and the guy on the, in the, in the, that was out there on the packing mat with me going, you are at the very top of what your industry is, and you're sitting there talking to me about glass ceilings. And I said, okay, point taken. Um, so anyway, I realized I couldn't keep packing parachutes forever. Uh, started doing some skydiving instruction, opened up a skydiving center, um, realized that I did like to fly. So now I've got a pretty full plate. I'm running a business. I'm volunteering with the school. I've got the children going. I'm trying to be super mom. And um, I realized that I wanted to fly. So I had to find a flight instructor that would wake up and be willing to fly at 7 a.m. Oh, what flight instructor wouldn't do that if they're driven? I right? just love you. I just, <laughs> I just absolutely love you. Um, and fortunately, I found an instructor very much like you mm -hmm. um, that was willing to do that. Not everyone was, was willing to do that. And at 7 in the morning, of course, it's the stillest air. Um, when you're first starting those maneuvers, uh, it's, it's the very best time. Because you have it's, it's clear, it's clean, it's clear, it's clear. Yeah. So I mean, it, it turned out as as usual with my life. It was just lucky that everything was the way it was. And then I realized I had to ground school. Well, you can't do ground school when you're doing all the other things. I found King Schools online. At four o'clock in the morning, you wake up. You you know you've done everything you can do with the day, and you're ready to start over. You will log into King Schools online, and I now own I think every one of their courses. For the, for the written exams? Um, for all of the written exams. Um, significant other, Larry Ehrlich, uh, became my significant other. And he was very instrumental, very positive. When you're learning to fly, you're, it's, it's difficult sometimes. You know, they expect you to know a lot. They expect pilots to be com completely responsible for every flight. Um, the Federal Aviation Administration is very unforgiving if, if you 
are not 110% behind being doing your job and doing it well. So I surrounded myself with other pilots. And um, if you went out to dinner with me, we talked about aviation. We talked about flying. It became my obsession. It became my passion. And, um, and I went uh, through all of, the, all of the pilot's ratings. Definitely had support from the family. Um, I think a lot of people don't have the friends I have, the support I have. And uh, I, there's an expression, never accept no from someone who's not authorized to say yes. If, you're, if your friends are telling you it's impossible, get rid of them. Move on to get people. Yeah, yeah. It's, this is, okay, this is where you want to go. We're going to take you there. This is what we're going to do. And a very, I have a very positive attitude towards um, when I was flying with you. You're, you're giving me new things. And, and if I wasn't completely on... The first couple of times, you're very patient. As a flight instructor, you are positive reinforcement, and you accept that the student is going to make a mistake sometimes. Um, you are definitely one of the flight instructors that I would recommend for a new student. I enjoy doing that. I haven't, I haven't really flown with new students in uh, a long time. But you're CFI, CFII? Yeah, MEI. Um, you're so funny when you talk about yourself. You're like, yeah, kind of, no, you are all those things. No, I had some pretty uh, successful students. I got one guy I want to get him uh, interviewed on the on, on the YouTube channel, too. He's flying, um, I think it's for Express Jet now. He's been with the airlines for like seven years. So I felt really good about that. He was the first guy I ever soloed. Um, actually, he was the first student to solo on the new runway when they rebuilt the runway over at uh, Eastman, Georgia. So that was kind of cool. People like you, I mean, so many so many friends in my life, when you ask them about themselves, I always talk about myself, when you ask people like you and um, I was just working with Paul and Nancy Fair, and when you, um, when you talk to these people, they very rarely talk about what they've done. They, you talk about your students, uh, Paul and Nancy talked about the pilots and the people that they had worked with. Uh, they, they seem to, the people that really get things done, don't talk about themselves. They're working so hard to get the people around them where they need to go. Mm, I guess, you know, positive energy is kind of infectious. And you want to build everybody up. I've had a lot of people build me up. And I think, like, along the way, okay, there were so many people. I did an internship in Atlanta, and I'm not from Atlanta, and I didn't have a ton of money, so I could do the internship, but it's not like I could get a place, you know, to rent in Atlanta. Um, so my buddy and his wife let me live in their guest room for a month. I mean, that's huge. And I'm like, I don't think I'll be able to pay you back, but maybe I can pass it forward. And uh, I've always had that mindset. I mean, there's been so many people to help me along the way. Um, if I can help somebody else, I would definitely want to do it. Um, but I, I know this, I kind of run across the same mindset. The people that are... Um, you have paid it forward. I mean, you've certainly... You know, you've, you've certainly been very patient with me in the 340 when we were flying. That. Oh, it's a blast. Um, Kathy and I did, uh, we brought in uh, Jerry Sharp to do uh, 340 initial training. And um, Kathy said, hey, can I come along? And so I called Jerry and, and he said, yeah, she'll have to cover the cost uh, for the additional season Fine. around school. Yeah. But she can ride along in the back. And so we've got some, what neat pictures Kathy was taking of uh, the training session in the 340. It was, it was very cool. In the back and, um, it was, I sent the pictures to his wife, uh, who probably didn't understand. I hope you explained to her what was going on there. You did, in the email. Um, but I, I do think the wives don't always know how phenomenal their husbands really are at some of the things that they don't understand, and I, I thought it was important to share that with your wife. Yeah, Kathy's talking just about some of the simulated uh, failures that we go through. It was pretty good. Initial training, so... Washington it's was got, pretty uh, cool. Post-its covered up over, you know, half the instruments, and we're coming in on a, a partial panel, a simulated single-engine ILS approach, and uh, it's pretty intense. The training's good, though. I mean, it, it, I enjoy training. And, of course, Chris training. is, as any good pilot is, hypercritical of his own performance, as kind as he is with my performance. He's, uh, he's a, a little overcritical of his own performance. I thought it was great. Okay, Kathy, I've got some more stuff here. Um, there's so much we could talk about. One of the things I wanted you to teach me when I first met you is from a non-skydive pilot, from someone who's in, in the air but not really familiar with skydive operations. 
I know for me, I flew corporate for like 10 years, and for a long time, I would be a little bit uneasy when I would go into an airplane, airport where they're having skydive operations because, hey, this is an uncontrolled field. There's no tower. Yeah, ATCs give me a heads up. Hey, there's, you know, you got jump, jumps taking place, you know, 10,000 and below or 11,000 and below um, at your airport. So just be advised. And I'd see the note you know, before he took off. But um, I would be, like, super cautious. I would start making radio calls, like, 20 miles out and just making lots of radio calls. I would, I would try to get lined up, like, maybe on a straight-in final, you know, five miles out and try to come in low. And I was just kind of unsure of like what the expectation was from the jumpers in the area, like what's common courtesy, um, what 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 do I need to know to be safe around uh, skydive operations when I'm coming in, you know, in a King Air, in a Baron. Um, so can you talk to me about that? Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I'm not going to get real technical because I'm sure a lot of people don't really. What you did is exactly what we want pilots to do. Um, the, especially at this airfield, it depends on where the skydivers are on the airfield, but at this airfield in Statesboro, our landing area is in the center of the field. So anyone who is on a standard approach path or in the landing pattern is not going to be where the skydivers generally are. So the full pattern? Yes. Upwind, crosswind, downwind, base. Right. The skydivers are going to be right in the middle of your landing pattern. Okay. In theory. Um, you know, a bad spot can totally change that. Something that I, I try to be understanding of everybody's reality of what they understand is going on. Overflying an airport at 2,000 feet when there are skydivers, there's been an announcement that skydivers on the air in the air is, is not good practice for a pilot. And I know as a student pilot, they want to come in, and a lot of student pilots come in here. They want to come in, they want to overfly the field, they want to look at the windsock, they, you know, they've listened to the ATIS, but they still want to, I think it's was here, they still want to make sure, they've listened to the weather, they still want to make sure that they see the windsock and that they're going the right way. Overflying the airport when there are skydivers in the air is not the best choice. Coming straight in approaches is a good idea. Some pilots will just vacate the area because they're so scared of, of hitting a skydiver and that's very cautious and that's that's very neat. I had a jet one time that was willing to wait for 10 minutes while we were in the air. That's not necessary and I did talk to Now was to he them. in the air waiting or was he on the, on was the ground? He in the air. In, oh wow. I've had them wait both in the air and on the ground and I try to make it a point to talk to them. If we don't share the federally funded airspace, none of us are going to be able to play. We all have to be nice to each other and, and, and pay attention to meeting each other's needs. Everybody contributes to the taxes that keep these airports open. And it, it, we have to play nice with each other. So I always make it a point to talk to them. A little bit of a technical thing is all the way, the different frequencies that we are required to communicate with. So sometimes you'll hear on the common traffic advisory, we're jumping skydivers and then we have to flip back to another frequency. So the pilots who've said, wait a minute, I heard you say something, what did you say? It's not that we're being rude. They may not it's catch the, you. Right. They may not catch us. So I try to monitor that common traffic advisory. The problem is at 11,000 feet, you're getting communication from as far south as Lakeland. I can literally hear my friends in Lakeland. Oh, and the, and the deal here at States is we've got to have a common traffic. 122.8, which is like the most common common traffic frequency and you're that hearing, I know of. You hear everybody. It's, it's and the awesome. higher up you get, the more you hear. Right. So even if someone kicks back at me on that frequency, I'm not necessarily going to be able to hear them over everybody else's chatter. Mm -hmm. So we make, we make a two-minute call. We make a call after they've left. We make a call under canopy. If a pilot gets very busy in the airplane and fails to make one of those calls, please come and talk to me. Um, you're not doing it intentionally, and, and we'll try to understand why the call was not made. Okay, and the other thing to know is if, if I'm on an instrument flight plan inbound, then air traffic control is going to be aware that you're in the area. So and they'll have, notify you. I mean, I should be getting it from common traffic, but I'll be getting it from ATC as well. Right. And, well. and a lot of times ATC, and I know this from flying corporate, you don't even have to be going into the airport where the skydive operations are. If you're close, uh, they think it's interesting, and they'll say, hey, if you look over, look you may be 10, 15 miles away, but they're like, you may spot a, a skydiver, you know. Because and how easy is it to spot those skydivers? Sometimes I do, sometimes <laughs> I don't. Um, it's 
for me, it's probably not as easy as I would think that it would be, you know, when you're... Okay, so how easy is it to see those skydivers while you're... It's harder than I would... It's harder than I would have thought it would be. I mean, you get this big canopy, they're normally bright colors, but, you know, when I'm several miles away looking down, it's, uh, it, it, it can be pretty hard to spot them. I was flying back from Kentucky last weekend, Kentucky uh, to Statesboro, and we overflew some airport they had skydiving operations. And I think, I think it was like 10 miles off the wing, and she said, oh, you may spot them. I never, I never saw anybody. And I don't know if they weren't in the air or just if it 10 miles would be impossible to spot them. Yeah, it's pretty hard to see them from 10 miles away. Yeah. It's certainly, yeah. Now, I know from, now, on, a, on the flip side, flying the jump plane itself, uh -huh. you let them out the door. That's an experience. Um, that was that was a good day when you took me up and kind of taught me how to do that. You were very quick. Getting get the door open, getting the door closed. But, um, no, I mean, I try to kind of keep an eye on them. And even being right over the top of them, sometimes you lose them. Because, uh, I mean, of course, you're starting to maneuver to get back down, you know. Yeah, you got some things to do. Pattern. You're still yeah. flying the airplane. And so, um, if I can close the door and then bank in the opposite direction and pick them up, I can, I can sometimes follow them for... A, a good ways, but if I lose them when I when I close the door, it's hard to, it's, find, it's them hard to find them again. So, um, and then definitely if they haven't got the chute open yet, you know, because they free fall. How long do you free fall before? Um, here it's about forty two seconds before that, we yeah, deploy. That's a that's a good free fall. Um, and then I learned this, but for people that don't know, if you're going to jump out of an airplane, what's the correct altitude? How do you make that decision? Um, are the correct altitude for deployment or the correct altitude to exit? For both. Um, well, the correct altitude to exit is going to depend on what kind of airplane you're operating. Uh, we do give a little extra altitude here for our accelerated freefall students. Uh, the reason that we do that is we want them to have as much time to perform the maneuvers as they can. We do some pretty funky things for our airplanes here. We have P-Ponk engines. Um, the P-Ponk engines allow us to climb faster. We go a little bit higher. We also have three-foot wing extensions. These are things that keep your weight in balance. We want our pilots to move on. We want them to, this is just one stepping stone, is being a jump pilot. So we do things with the airplanes that allow us to go a little bit higher. And we do things that make sure that our pilots are going to stay within weight and balance and going to adhere to the FARs, federal aviation requirements. Um, yeah, I noticed that it was uh, flying skydivers. The, the goal is to take off basically at max gross um, without going over and then um, you fly the mission you get up you get down as quickly as possible and you try to do it all without shock cooling my engine without shock Be cooling the my engine. engine please and um, don't exceed any operating limitations <laughs> right and within the limitations of the in engine cooling right. um, doing it with the as fast as turns uh, as you can sure. like, as efficiently as possible sure. Um, so really, skydiving is, uh, it's, it's higher performance flying than I'm used to. You know, I think flying, it is. you know, a lot of times you'll think, oh, I've been flying these bigger airplanes, and so I'm going back to flying a, a 182 is not that big a deal, but this is, I mean, this is hard flying. It's, uh, it, you're, you're doing maximum performance maneuvers pretty much the entire time. It gets easier. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you get used to it, you get in a zone, but for people that don't know, like flying skydivers is, uh, You caught on very fast, hard work. you did very well. You did, we have had, um... Even even jet jocks. I mean, I had a jet jock that came to work for us. Uh, he just kind of wanted to do a, a, a load or two, and um, he, he flew one load, and that was it. Um, it wasn't for him. No, um, he wasn't for us. Oh. <laughs> um, he, he, I don't know, I don't know what he he did when he was flying. But if if he's going to shock hole my engine, if he's going to do anything to hurt my airplane. Well, you know, it's like tur turboprops, jets, there's no shock cooling. You don't have to worry so, about it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Going back and forth from uh, the Twin Cessna or the Baron to something like the King Air, you know, you, you fly them differently. And um, I guess if you kind of get in the mindset that, you know, you're used to flying this. He seemed to be oblivious that it was that it was uh, an, a limitation. Hmm. So, okay. Um, we won't do that again. Yeah. And it wasn't like he really wanted to do it. It wasn't like he really wanted to John. So you mentioned the pilots that you bring on. Um, we were talking about this over breakfast, and it's looking back. There, there were doors that were open to me as a commercial pilot that I didn't realize were open. So you guys that are in 
flight school or aspiring to get into the field, I, I think a lot of the times there are doors that open to young professionals before they realize that they're open. So tell me, like, what if, if I wanted to come fly for you? If I'm, you know, I just got my commercial rating. Who do you look for? What are the, what are you looking for in a pilot? You know, who's a good fit? And at what point can you can you make the jump and hey, I'm going to get paid to, to fly some airplanes here? As as a pilot or as a business owner or as anyone in America today, and, and never accept no from someone who's not authorized to say yes. That's great advice. Um, as as a business owner, you know you can. People in government love to tell you no. If they tell you no, they don't have to do anything further. They've told you no, but they can go back to whatever they were doing. Mm -hmm. Um, find someone who is going to get to yes. We're Americans, we're supposed to move to the next step. I've got people with 255 hours who've shown up. I have a commercial pilot's rating and now I expect to be paid. Um, probably not going to get me to yes. Um, at 255 hours, even if you have graduated from Emory Riddle, you have no experience. Well, in the 255, that's, or two, 250 is the requirement for commercial civil. Right. For a Part 61 school, right? Is it, isn't it lower for was, 141? Um, I thought 250. We I, should have this on our fingertips. We should know this. We should know this. We we'll have to look it up. But I, I think it was 190 for a, in a, in a 141 school. If you're enrolled in a 141 school, the hour requirement's less. You would know this better than I would. I'll have to look that up. If, if I'm wrong, uh, I'll, I'll put a pop up. In right, because we but, need uh, to. The, the minimum number of hours that anyone has come to us requesting a job is 255. 250. Um, and 272, a guy named Eric Warren came to work with us at 272 hours. He did not really have 272 hours. He'd been flying on his daddy's knee since he was four years old, and this kid was incredible. Um, the, the long list of pilots that we've kept, and, and you're in that category, um, the long list of pilots that we've kept that are, all they care about is flying. Mm -hmm. um, they get a free minute at home, and they're studying manuals. I don't think people understand the, the pilot in command of their aircraft when they fly commercially, if you look at Skullenberger's book, I love to read books about aviation, Skullenberger's book, he was an uh, Air Force Academy graduate, um, flew gliders, and he was perfectly suited to land on the Hudson on that day. And he's also perfectly suited to write his book, which was um, what matters most, I think. Um, but it, it, he was perfectly suited to carry that incident and make things better for the people around him. Very, very cool thing. And that's what we do with our pilots who come in. Our new pilots, um, Larry Ehrlich, uh, the significant other, has uh, he flew MD-11s as a career. He has a very regimented attitude towards flying. When he brings someone in, he wants them to become to the airline standard. And, and so when you come here, we don't pay very well. You've got a bare minimum of hours. Yes, you're a commercial pilot. It's more of an internship. You're lucky if you make fuel money. I don't think people understand what these pilots have forfeit in their lives to get to the level that they're at. And every time they get into the cockpit, there is one person the Federal Aviation Administration holds responsible for everything that they're doing. And these pilots want it that way. Pilots understand this is my flight, I am completely responsible, and they work with everything they have to make sure that they're successful. I have another good friend, he's going to kill me for mentioning this, Tom Witherspoon. Tom Witherspoon flies for US Air, I got the company right, and um, in, in his free time, he uh, owns an RV6, and he goes out and he practices maneuvers. That's his idea of how to unwind after, mm -hmm. after I just, I have so much respect for the professional pilots, and I do view flying jumpers. We keep you within gliding distance of the airfield. We, we want you to get more comfortable in the airplane. You may not think that after the first flight is, a, you know, we just throw you into the fire there. It's intense. It is it's pretty wild, but we really do. Um, I go up as many times as I need to. You were turned loose very soon because you seemed to be very comfortable very early. I have, I have some pilots I've gone up I had one guy I flew about 24 flights with before I finally gave up. 24? Oh, yeah. Me on my knees in the back. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I had one pilot, he's 22 years old, he complained because he had to watch me fly a flight and he was on his knees and I was like, excuse me, I've just spent a total of eight hours on my knees watching you fly mm -hmm. and, and now I'm asking you to get on your knees to fly one flight. Um, 
a lot of the Emory Riddle guys come out and they think I'm a professional pilot and every plane is is going to be you know a brand new regional jet and and it's kind of it's kind of new for them they they are expected to change the oil here they are expected to troubleshoot if something is the least bit wrong, wrong with the airplane I want to know before it's actually an issue the expectation for pilots from a jump plane on is extremely high and the people that are willing to do this I, I just I, I love them I have so much respect for them that was probably too windy no, no, that's good. Keep going. How are we doing on time? Got a... Yep. Okay, another several minutes before it cycles again. All right, about ten. Okay, um... Kathy, tell me about some of the um, statistics uh, for safety with skydiving, some of the myths. Um, I know for... I'll share this ex experience. Um, we moved to Stage Row back in February. Um, I had been in here on corporate flights before then and saw the sign, the jumping place. And I was like, oh, that's cool. They've got uh, somebody who's trying to drum up business because the college is here. And I didn't realize how big you were. I didn't realize. Um, I'm small. You're small. I am a small skydiving small. center. There are some really big skydiving centers, centers out there. Um, I came down here one day to introduce myself. And I, I, did we talk about, I don't know, it just... You know, it's good for pilots to know each other. So I think I just came down and let you know I'd be flying 340, and we kind of got to be. I think I hired there. you. I think I went. Okay, I like this guy. You're in. You said, well, you said, yeah, maybe we can check you out. You can do some flying for us on the weekends or something. Um, my wife, when we got married, scared to death of flying, and I got to take her up in a Baron, and she flying's not her favorite thing. She don't want to go fly uh, on the airline. Like that's that's not a good day for her. Um, but now if we she can help her with that. Well, she, yeah, she's gotten better. She's gotten so much better. Um, Let me just talk to her for a little while. Yeah. Well, Kathy, you have talked to her because uh, I'm going to tell the whole story. Go ahead. Um, with my old job, Jennifer got to go on some corporate flying trips with me, and she got to where you like the flying was cool because on this trip it makes sense for her to go. We get to go to the beach and get a hamburger. Or, you know, that's a, kind of a cool date. You know, like a, a that's a pretty cool really, date. Really cool date. Yeah, um, I don't know too many people that get to pull that one off. Well, and we don't. It's it's a few and far between. But when you get those opportunities, um, take them. They're really cool. So and then you know, I, I just like most people, I get them up in the airplane and I'm like, hey, let me show you how this thing flies. Let me you know ask questions. You know, look look at something in the cockpit that, that you think's interesting and let me explain it to you. And um. So eventually she got to the point where, you know, flying's kind of cool. She, she likes to have the opportunity to go occasionally. Um, and so we move here and I meet you. And I come home and I'm like, oh, I'm at this, uh, I'm at Kathy and she's got <laughs> skydive school and I'm going to fly airplanes for her and we may get to go skydiving. And my wife's like, you're nuts. That's crazy. We have young kids. You can't do that. And, um, and then she's like, she kind of came around and she's like, well, if you want to jump, that's okay. And I've read the statistics. I think it's probably fine, but I don't want to do it. I have no interest in that. And she was steadfast. And, and one day, I, like, I brought her out here. I was like, I'm going to bring the kids out. I'm going to fly the jump plane. I want y'all to watch. I want you to meet some of these people are really neat. And before we got out of the car, she looks up and there's some guys coming down. He had let out some jumpers and she sees the parachutes and she looks up and she's like, well, you know, that looks kind of cool. Um... Maybe I'd reconsider, and so we hang out here, you know, that morning, and then my sister, um, who is fearless, and I've talked about her in previous videos, you know, riding roller coasters when she was too short, and uh, bungee jumping, you know, it was like a young Did she baby. stuff her shoes so she could... She, she'd do whatever she had to yeah. do to get on the ride. My mom them. would, you know, she'd, be, she'd get I on like the ride. Already. So my sister is like, I'm going to come skydive because you're flying the jump plane, and my mom is the same way. That's where my sister gets it from. So they come down and my, we're going to have like a family skydive day. So I fly the, the mission and my mom and my sister go for their first jump. And when I land and get on the ground, uh, I see my wife like talking to one of the instructors with a harness. I'm like, what's going on? And Kathy's like, well, I've talked your wife into it with the stipulation that you have to go with her. Now, I've never jumped before, but I said, if she's going to go, absolutely I'll go. So we both suited up and you flew for our first mission. Somebody had to fly. Yeah. And so Jennifer, we both did tandem jumps. I, I really wanted to do the AFF course, but, um, this is for your wife. Do the tandem. Yeah. So my <laughs> wife, um, 
We did it. We did the Tana It was job. just the hottest date you've ever had. It was awesome. It was great. <laughs> and uh, we got the video. Jennifer's video is on YouTube. I need to put mine up. Hers is on the channel, so you can click my channel and, and find the video of her jump. Um, and she landed in, in, in uh, was it, I think, Scott. Scott jumped with her. Right. And, uh, and he said, would you do it again? And she said, absolutely, I would do it again. Um, so there's an example of someone that she knew nothing about it. She's freaked out. She's scared to death. And then she gets around it, and she's like, oh, okay, well, she comes around and does it and has a great experience. So I was so glad when she jumped with you. I was, it was amazing. It was I, I do. It's, 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 I, it is the hottest day you'll ever have, and it should definitely be with your wife. Yeah. Um, it's, statistically, when I started skydiving, there were 3,300 active skydivers in the United States. We had, I don't know, that was the first year they kept statistics. Mm -hmm. 3,300 active skydivers and 24 fatalities that year. In recent years, I do attend. This all sounds really fun, and we haven't told people how much we have to hit the books and how much we have to study to be able to do all this uh, flying. Um, it's not for free. The, in recent years, we had one year 19 fatalities, over a million skydivers made that year, 33,000 active skydivers, 19 um, fatalities, and, and we're talking 33,000 skydivers versus 3,300 when there were 24 fatalities. I mean, it is, we have done... So, so, so 3,300 and there were 24. Right. Now you're talking 33,000. 33, and we are... There and are there's more, how many? There were 19 in recent years. So it went years, down. In recent years, right. With 10 times the And if you look at the statistics, because I go to parachute, I've attended every parachute industry association symposium that they've ever had. I've attended every, I'm also an FAA master rigger. What, what is that? You have to tell me what, what that is. Uh, the what parachute industry, industry association is um, all of the people that design and manufacture the equipment for skydiving. And then while they're doing that, the Federal Aviation Administration, there was no continuing education for riggers. And in, in 91 um, was the first time I attended PIA, and I think that was the year they started with the continuing education. And I have attended every, every seminar. My children, this is our idea of a vacation. And one of the things that you go to is a seminar concerning the fatalities. We also do uh, you, the United States Parachute Association's um, Safety Day. And part of that is we look at the fatalities, we look at the incidents, we, we try to figure out what went wrong and how do we make skydiving safer? Because skydiving is inherently dangerous. Anyone who tells you skydiving is anything other than inherently dangerous is not being truthful. Having said that skydiving is inherently dangerous, when my daughter was 14, she decided uh, with straight A's and honors classes and a high enough SAT score to get into college that she wanted to go skydiving. And, uh, and saying no didn't seem like the right thing to do. So can you skydive at 14? Not anymore. Um, as a matter of fact, my 17-year-old son is having to wait until he's 18. So 18 is the... The lawyers have uh, seized the country, and, yeah. and, and therefore my son will have to wait. Because as we are protesting the rules, you have to play within the rules. Um, the manufacturers have asked that we not um, skydive anyone under 18 years of age, and we don't. Okay, so we had a couple of minutes before this this uh, section wraps up. So real quick, um, all right, you're in this world. You were in it before the rules changed. Uh -huh. What's, from your opinion, what's the correct age? When is someone old enough to make that decision, and what should the age be, um, or is it just parental consent? I think it should be, um, and and we used to do it with parental consent um, for a while. You could go, uh, Mike Mullins. Uh, FedEx pilot, very good friend of my family, awesome human being, great King Air. Um, Mike Mullins, uh, his, I think he's jumped his children as low as six. He's a master rigger. He, that's just how his age. He's, that's, six years of my son. Okay. Um, I do think it depends on the family that they're in. Mm -hmm. I, I think it depends on the family's information. I think if you're, I would not have made that choice at age six for my children. I do not think I have a right to judge someone with as much information as Mike Mullins has. What happened, the reason it is 18 now, is a um, young man got his parents to sign away his rights. He uh, had a football scholarship and he crammed his ankle into the ground and ruined his, you have to do what the tenor master says, lift up your feet when they tell you to lift up your feet. Well, he didn't, he dropped his feet and um, he ended up uh, ultimately suing his parents because his parents didn't have the right 
to take away his rights. And how old was, was he? He was, I think he was 16 or 17. Okay, let's wrap it up for this, uh, okay. this section. And, and but that changed it for all of us. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, Kathy, before we, we took a break and off camera we were kind of discussing in, in my past recent video, um, I was talking about the passion and the drive that people have for aviation, um, but it's a field, I believe, with a pretty high barrier to entry. There's a lot of training that's required, a lot of time, and a lot of money commitment, and I know people that started down this road and didn't continue, and so I was making the point that um, if, if aviation is not for you, you know, you want to try to figure that out early on before you, you know, put so much investment into something that you're not going to make a reality. And then you brought up a great point, and I'll kind of let you take it from here because you had a little bit different perspective. I think everybody should fly airplanes. Um, I, I started flying, I had, when I started flying seriously, I had four children. Uh, a lot of people um, mentioned to me that it's a money pit, you're never going to get out of it what you put into it. Um, I love to fly. I love to take off an airplane and I love to land an airplane well. I think everybody should be allowed to do this. Some people are going to have a harder time doing this. Um, and I'm, I'm actually going to take this into skydiving. We, we didn't do this before. What we did mention before is every single moment in your life takes you to where you are now. You can reflect on that moment and you can go, oh man, that was a really hard landing. and and man, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, and you can beat yourself up, and you can walk away, and you can be one of those people who plays Nintendo all the time. I know, you think Nintendo's okay. Um, Nintendo's okay. I'm losing the Nintendo vote. <laughs> um, but what you, can, what you do is everything that you've done to this point, successful people, nothing succeeds like success. A successful person has a minor misstep. They don't beat themselves up over it. They go, okay, what did I do wrong? What do I learn from it? How do I make my next moment better? And they have all this experience. People that beat themselves up over those moments, people that just walk away, it's over. It's, it's done. As soon as you give up, it's over. You know, you give up on your business, well, close the doors, walk away. You give up on skydiving. People will say that I have a, I, I'm too easy on my students when I'm skydiving. And that is not true. When they get through the levels, they've completed every objective. Mm -hmm. and, um, and people also say that I'm more of a, a cheerleader to my students than I am. Okay, my children are very successful. Cheerleading your child into the next math equation mm -hmm. is going to work a lot better than having the poor child crying. And, and I know it's hard for the parents. It's, it's new math and they need to go to the seminars and they need to hang out in the classroom like I do. And they need to make it easier. Anyway, back to the flying. Um, some people are going to take a lot more money and a lot more time. And it's really not fair because people that are independently wealthy, they go, they slap down the money, they go right through the program, and they have so much to draw from. People who don't have so much money, it takes them longer. Um, when it takes you longer, it's a little bit more hard. And they probably don't have people around them going, yes, you can do this. Back to skydiving. I have had two students, one took 24 skydives before he got through what was a seven level program. He was terrified getting in the airplane. The pilot we had flying was Larry, the significant other, and he would shake the seat when he got in. And Larry and I had a lot of discussions. What if he has a malfunction? What if he can't deal with the malfunction? Mark, you're going to hate me. Mark Presley uh, will tell you to this day, um, he still skydives. Um, it was very, very... So he, got, he got through it. Holy he man. It. He and through. so many people gave up on him. And there was a point where I was actually... It is an entirely different element. When you're flying, you're going up in the air. You've never done this before. Don't pull back on the yoke, which is your natural reaction. That's going to go really bad. Let the airplane fly itself. Sometimes let go. And getting Mark to the point... he, I discounted him at the end. I felt so bad how much money it was costing him. Mark Presley is a skydiver. Now, there are some people, if you are scared out of your mind, maybe you know something about yourself, I don't. If we can't get control of your headspace in the cockpit, in the air, um, under the water, if you're scuba diving, if you are just scared out of your mind and we can't take you past that, then that becomes a different story. It is aviation. It is it, it is the next level. It's three-dimensional space. There's a lot more going on. Mm -hmm. And for some people, maybe they know something I don't. Maybe Nintendo is their safest place. It's not mine. 
Well, I wonder if um, our different perspectives, maybe we're talking about a slightly different things and you would say like aviation is for everyone everyone should enjoy well if you remember back to this what you said was you were concerned about how much money aviation costs like flight training flight training the, the someone's whole program someone's been flight training for a year and all that money is gone and and you maybe indicated that I came from maybe a little more money and I did not I started this business packing parachutes with a child on my back so um, this is uh, definitely from a, from the ground up sort of a business. Um, I don't think the money that you spent on learning is ever money that's lost. That education, I agree. I agree with that. that information, you carry it forward, and that person may get control of their headspace later on, and may be able to fly later on. Um, maybe they should spend some time in flight simulators. So, you know, it's a little safer area to get the checklist down, which is why we have them. So, so I, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand regrets. I, I think that every single thing that you've done in your life, even if you had a minor bump in the road, mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe you didn't, maybe you went and you took a path and you didn't continue on that path. Maybe you came back and you went on another path. You still have the information from that. Time. You took something away from the experience. You, for you sure. learned absolutely, and I've had learned. those experiences. I, I had a pass that didn't, we didn't go all the way down the path, you know. And then you come but, uh, back. But then, actually, you know, and that's a, those are different stories, different situations, but they do, you kind of springboard off or you carry information away from that experience and apply it in a different experience. So there's always value added Absolutely. when you're learning. And anybody that, that takes us to learn aviation is going to have added value. Even, even um, a student that doesn't make it through the program, because there are some people that, if you have a tendency to panic in a high stress situation, this is probably not for you. And and maybe in time that won't happen. But take the time to get yourself. Don't go out and start in a regional jet. That would be silly. That would be reckless. Give yourself, stretch yourself a little bit at a time. And jumping out of an airplane is not stretching a little bit at a time. <laughs> what happens the very first time you jump out of an airplane is pretty wild stuff. So. Yeah, but it's, there's a system to it. It's very controlled. The equipment's very it is good. Controlled. The, the, the system has been proven, and it so has. you're in good hands. It um, has. I felt very comfortable, and that you know, new experiences. Um, in the back of my head, the day you asked me to skydive, I, I'm pretty confident. Um, not really scared of all. I mean, I, I think I've got a healthy fear of the things that we should be fearful Absolutely. of. Absolutely. And so I take the proper precautions, but it doesn't get in my head. It doesn't mess with me. I've had emergencies in the airplane. I didn't panic. I didn't lose control. It's like, okay, well, you start unlocking my, the My My favorite story, and we have to get this on this, was when you were a, a student pilot, brand new, um, and you were, you were with someone else. Did you have your private yet or no? Are you talking about the The one where you were failure? on the phone. You're on the phone yeah, in gonna, IMC. I'm going to do a whole video on that. Oh, that okay. You can go back time. to that one. Um, you totally need to go back to that one. Yeah. Because be that was definitely sure. not panicking, mm -hmm. figuring out what resources you had, utilizing the resources, the people who were those resources working to make this happen. Mm -hmm. I, it was it was very, very So, I've, all right, that's one example. I've been in situations, and it's not... I, I remember being a kid and somebody locked me in a box and I was overcome with fear and I panicked. I haven't experienced that. Why did somebody do that? Uh, he was just a jerk. We were like in the back of this guy's uh -huh. uh, station wagon and you know the kids would get in the so box. So did you eventually just start breathing? What did you I do? I think I screamed and kicked and flailed until his mom made him open the box. I think. But I, So I, as a kid I remember having that experience of like uncontrolled, unrestrained fear. We call it panic. Panic. Fear um, panic. But Not I, a good place. I mean, I've been in bad situations as an adult, and, uh, I, and I don't know. Everything's relative. I mean, Do you, you think know. being in the box helped you to deal with things later on, or do you think that was just something that was... I don't know, but it stands out. I, I can right. say that I've had the experience of panicking as a kid, but I've been in situations where I've seen other people panic, um, and it just stuff doesn't seem to get to me. Now, in the back of my mind that day we skydived, I thought... There's going to be a point where where I'm going to have to deal with some fear. Like, I'm, we're going to open the door, I'm going to realize I'm going out of this thing, and I'm going to have to deal with that. And I kind of, I didn't think about it, I didn't dwell on it, and it never happened. Like, we opened the door, and I knew, like, I've seen this, this is how it goes, it's the next steps to kind of inch over to the door, we're going to roll out, we're going to flip a few 
few times and then try to, um, you know, get upright. And um, then I'm going to be, as a pilot, trying to figure out my orientation. I'm going to be looking around and looking at the altimeter. So this is Chris on, on his first skydive. He wants to know his heading. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, relative to the airport, I mean, that's I would awesome. look down. So that, that, that's what was going through my head. And to, to my surprise, there was never any pilot. moment of like, oh, what am I going to do? This is scary. Uh, you know, it, there wasn't that big thing you have to overcome. You know, as the door popped open. So, um, I think you're unusual. I've been accused of that before. <laughs> That's interesting, though. But yeah, I mean, I, I definitely. Uh, I do. I do. And, I do and, want people to not dwell on. I, I had an instructor for my child who wanted every child to fail the first. The first. Uh, assignment, mm -hmm. and then that became the baseline, and they could build forward from that. That is not my philosophy. Um, my children are very accomplished, and I would rather see pom poms and cheerleading when instructing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I see absolutely re no reason to put someone down. No, I agree. They're, As they're a student, doing the best they can. Yeah, I remember responding to the instructors who, like, they wanted me to win. You know, absolutely, Those were the guys, and and so. You make the, your most progress. You move forward, like with the most and efficiency, it feels and it's fun. I mean, right. like I remember struggling at times. Um, early, it's hard. Very some early in the flight training. Yeah, I struggled, and then I, there was like a hurdle that I got over. And once you get, it's fun to, to be good at what you're doing, and once you kind of get to that point, whether it's flying or whether it's uh, you know playing a Nintendo game or whatever, running marathons, right? You get to a point where like, whoa, I've never been this good before. You, you break through to a new level and it's it's fun. It's a blast. Um, so I, I can appreciate that. And I agree, positive reinforcement. Um, I responded to that well. Especially with four children. You have four children. Yeah, yeah, we, we try to do that with our kids too. Yeah. Well, um, all right, we gotta go fast because we got okay. a few more things to cover. Getting it. Um, I want you to talk to me about your business. Let's talk about the business side of running a skydive center. Um, if you can, I don't know if you want to get into specifics, but numbers, you know, what are you, um, how many employees do you have? I have how no much, employees. You have um, no employees. I have no employees. Um, uh, we, we have independent contractors. Um, they take off when, when they want to, which was very stressful uh, a couple of weekends ago. Thank you. Um, we, and the reason is I have a philosophy that you need to be working for yourself. This is a capitalist country. Um, we, we pay per item, mm -hmm. and that's why we've stayed in business so long, because we don't have, we have a minimum amount of overhead in, when we're not producing a product. Now, we do pay our people very well, so when we are producing that product, um, that also means there's a lot, a lot of money flowing through that's going directly to the people that are making the money. Um, a friend of mine says I'm the most uh, socialist Republican he's ever met because I do believe that if you're running your business well, you're working for your community, you're working to take care of the people around you. The people who are business owners are the ones that are supposed to be taking care of the people that are working with their company. And of course, fortunately, our people feel the same way and they give back to the business. It's a pretty neat thing to do and a lot of business owners do that. I have advised people to start their own business who hate me now. Um, I probably did not mention that the business, 4 o'clock in the morning, if you're not studying King Schools, you are going to be putting together, analyzing data, checking your spreadsheets out. You can't be stupid about running a business. You have to check your cash. You have to know that the money that you were supposed to take in made it to the bank. You have to make sure that um, and we're a family business. so um, Your kids help you. Oh, they do. They do. Um, one of my children went for over a year uh, working very hard for my company, and we were not in a position to pay him. So, um, it's and my family is is very neat. There, there's very minimal drama. They don't they don't put up with drama if everyone's getting crazy dramatic. We try to go back to the numbers, try to sit down and figure out what the what the problem is and what the what the solution is. You're instilling life skills into your kids too that don't, they're going to take forward. To, uh, and you've got grown kids. You said they're very successful. You've got oh, a chemical yeah. engineer, yeah. mechanical engineer. Yeah. Georgia so. Tech, mechanical engineering. Yay, Mariah. Um, Casey finished USF chemical. I'm very, very excited. For all those people that told me I didn't know how to raise children. <laughs> um, You're doing great. It we, sounds yeah, like. we got that covered. Um, and Casey and Marcus, the two eldest, are very interesting. They're working. It's a global economy. 
if, if you're not working globally, mm -hmm. um, you're missing the boat. And, and there you are actually working with some, some contracts um, with uh, Qatar right now, which is, which is very neat. So. Uh, very, very lucky, very diverse. And as a parent, when your children uh, invite you on the snowboarding trip after they're full grown, you know that you did your job. And that I want to go is, snowboarding with my mom. Like is, take her. Yeah, we, take her. we need to do that. It's okay, you can come with us because I do snowboarding cheaper than anyone you've ever met. I want to put the, get our families together for a trip. I actually, I, I didn't buy snowboarding pants and I sort of fell when I was snowboarding. Oh, is that? And, and I, yeah, I, I love these jeans. I'm not going to get rid of them, but they have a hole in them from snowboarding. So on the business side, I want to know um, how many, how many loads a weekend, you know, what do you, what, what do you shoot for? Where are you going to break even? Where are you going to make money? What, um, if I, if I was in this to make money, I, I would have done something else for a living. Um, so it's a hard, it's And a, it's nobody a, makes money. We're all moving money. Nobody, okay. The government prints it, but nobody's manufacturing it. Um, what at the end of the day, what I look at is um, now, mind you, we have a balanced budget. I mean, we're not reckless. If if you were reckless, you, you would not stay in business. You wouldn't be here very long, right? You you have to. And and Casey gets a, a little bit. I I will decide. We made a, a an investment recently because a manufacturer came out with a more comfortable harness. And we really didn't have the funds to do it. We weren't in a position to do it. I just did it. Um, if there's a more comfortable harness for our tandem passengers, we're buying it. Mm -hmm. And and my son and my daughter, they're much more responsible, and they're kind of the ones that keep us baseline. And they and they do kind of go, Mom, did you really? And then recently we invested in uh, in a friend's uh, airplane. She was having a little bit of trouble, and the kids are going, you say we don't make enough money. There's no, you spend it all through. and then. And then you're off helping everyone that you can come up with, Mom. Come on. But I think business owners do that. I think they decide this is the right thing to do. They spend the money and, and they rock on. Um, I, I think you have to believe in the people around you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, and, and I think you have to, if you're working more for the people around you and not worrying so much um, about the cash, but be responsible enough to make sure that the cash is in the bank. Because um, we recently had to move overnight, and that was a, a very, we moved two hours north overnight, and that was, it had to do with some really bad politics. Um, oh, the business moved? Overnight. I mean, literally, we lost zero weekends. Um, and we had, um, wow. in, in a place called St. Mary's, Georgia, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'm going to slide it in here. Okay. Um, they put in government, uh, small government in Georgia at its best. J. Jeffrey Stanford named his son J. Jeffrey Stanford, and at four Juliet six, J. Jeffrey Stanford is the airport manager over J. Jeffrey Stanford, who is the only uh, commercial aviator on that federally funded field. And what happened was we were shut down overnight. Um, a Casey's friends from college, Casey and Marcus, brought their friends from college. They packed up our entire drop zone. We rented U-Haul trailers. Our, our clients uh, donated time and energy. Uh, we came to Statesboro, Georgia. You want to talk about a bad day at work, right? Came to Statesboro, Georgia. Uh, the people here, um, Ellis Wood, who is spoken with reverence in this community for a good reason, uh, literally had us operating here the following weekend. Wow. There were two weekends when we could not operate in St. Mary's. Our next closest competitor allowed us to operate at his skydiving center. Wow. So, yeah. Fr friendly competition. Yeah. And, uh, um, help each other out. Art Schaefer, Scott Ipolak, oh, those guys rock. Um, and I'm going to do something also unusual. Um, there's, what's Billy's last name? Carter. Billy Carter um, in Walterboro. He's been very, very uniquely helpful for someone who runs a skydiving center so close to our skydiving center. It's kind of different. Skydiving is kind of different. They all, they all want to, we all have to help each other. The economy is getting tougher, um, and we all have to. I, although skydiving is going up, you know, everyone's saying. I want to talk to you about that. Where are things headed? How much? How much volume are you doing? And where's it going to be in, in six months? You know, two years. We, where do you see it going? We had a, a slight decline for a, a couple of months. Um, I was attacked by run, while running by a dog, and I kind of folded in on myself. And things were kind of they folded in for a couple of months. That's the only time we've had a decline, um, and and I kind of came out of that, and, and that's, um, I've been more injured running in Georgia than I've ever been injured skydiving, so bring a weapon with you when you run. Bring a weapon Make with sure you're you ready run. for that <laughs> attack, yeah. yeah.
anyway, where it's going, if, if you are incredibly optimistic, you belong in business for yourself. But it will consume you. It will take everything you have. You give it all you got. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy. Are we done? <laughs> all right, Kathy, you seem to be on a roll here. So we were going to cover a few more things. We talked about the business perspective. If, if there's any more of that that you want to cover, go ahead. I wanted to find out from you um, what would be your advice to people who are currently pursuing flight training or looking for a, um, a future in the field of aviation. Really Call me. <laughs> Call you? Oh, here's the number. Um, if you're, if, go ahead. And, oh, and then also just, um, I mean, we kind of were setting this channel up to focus specifically on aviation, but we've got a lot of good uh, material that's just good for anybody. Anybody that wants to be professional, anybody that wants to be a winner, to be a go-getter. It doesn't, a lot of these principles don't just apply to aviation, so you don't have to keep it just in that. I mean, you can open it up and... You know, what would be your advice to people who want to be a better businessman, a better husband, a better wife, um, you know, a better family, better parent? Um, we want to inspire people. So what have you learned that we could benefit from? If you're having a really hard day, anything at all, I, I left my phone number to one of my uh, children's instructors once. Mm -hmm. If anything's wrong, call me. And she calls me up, and she's like in tears, and she's hysterical. And she, I said, anything at all. And she's hysterical. And I, Okay, what did my child do? Oh, your child didn't do anything. You said I could call you. Call me. Um, if I, you know, you're gonna get calls. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Every, but I do. I think if we, I think if we all work together, we can find the solutions to everything, including. Hold on to your seats. Uh, the the national debt. But I think we're all kind of in this idea that the national debt is so large we can't fix it. Well, that first thing that needs to do is you have to change that. Everyone has to believe that we can get this under control, and people within the government need to get their section of the government un under control. My business has to be balanced. Uh, my budget has to be balanced. Our budget, our family budget, has to be balanced. And you don't. I mean, they God, don't I'll let agree. you just run with it. And I think America needs to have that have to be strong. If you're opening your own business, um, as I talk about not caring about money, I clearly care about it enough that we have family discussions. Um, when we get together at Thanksgiving, there's going to be, that's what we do. We talk about the business, about and, business. And, and where the money is going and, and what we want to do and what direction we're going. Where I see the business going is um, eventually we'll move into Turbin. Um, Mr. Fayard, Paul Fayard and Nancy are giving us an opportunity to, to kind of get our feet wet with that. I'm very lucky with the friends that we have. Um, You're going to get a... A Kodiak. Yeah. I don't know. I'll believe it when it's here. Um, wow. But I and and it is. We are not ready for it. We're, the numbers are not there. But Paul Farad is uh, is is willing to do some exceptional things to make this happen here. And Mr. Fayard and Nancy have a very good reputation for investing well. And I hope I live up to everything else they've invested That's in. That's really exciting. It is really exciting. exciting. Okay. What else did you ask? Um, things when you don't. If you have a, a spouse. All of your friends have to be behind you and that spouse staying together. Um, there Don't are, pick the right friends again. Oh, right? yeah. I, but you and your wife, you're both very beautiful people. <laughs> Either one of you, you get a friend that's telling you the other one isn't perfect, you get rid of that friend, especially friend, yeah. if, you know, if it's a girl for you or a guy for her. Um, there, are, there are some not good people in the world, and you have to keep those people out of your... You can try to help them, and you want to try to help them, but you can't let them get too close to you. They'll damage you. And they can certainly damage, you know, especially with your children. And the children, oh, for God's sake, spend time with them. Um, if you can be in the public school system, uh, not so much in Georgia. That was a problem I had with the public school system in Georgia, so I commute to Florida now. Um, of course, we homeschool. And, well, I, apparently you have some of the similar problems. Um, I, I am very much a part of, of my children's um, educational uh, if they have something that they bring home that you don't understand, look at YouTube or call me. Um, if I can't come up with the problem, we've got two chemical, a chemical and a mechanical engineer in the family, and we can Skype them. I mean, with computers, it, I think some people think they don't have the answer. And everybody has to believe that they do have the answer. Business owners know that they are going to fix every problem. You can go get it. I heard an interview recently with a... Uh, uh, on YouTube, and the guy was saying, you know, we're, as a business owner, he's like, I become most creative when I'm backed into a corner. Oh, and there's yeah. not a way out. So I'll just overcommit and, like, generate the solutions as I go, you know? And so, 
I know sometimes it seems like how am I going to get this done? Or, you know, how am I going to get there? And, and you know, successful people get it done. They perform over and over again. It's like you, you look back and like, oh, that, that seems so tough at the time. But um, now we're dealing with even bigger problems, trying to get to even bigger goals. So that's. Um, and but you do have you have the help of the people around you. That yeah. Yeah. Surround yourself with. Uh, positive, successful people. Yeah. Oh, and find a need. Um, a, a lot of people are out of work now, and that's a very depressing place to be. Um, find a need. Look around your community, see what's uh, see what what needs to be done, and then start a business doing that. That's what business owners do. They find a need and they fill it. Wow. Yep. Okay, Kathy. Thank you. Um, this has been awesome. I think we got some good. Uh, covered a lot of good. I, I hope we do. Here. I hope we do some good. Yeah. I hope we Okay. Um, if people want to come skydive in Statesboro, Georgia, how do they get in oh, touch Oh, this you? is the place. Yeah, the jumping place. That's my cell phone. And uh, Or if you're having problems with the children, give me a call. Preferably not at 4 a.m., but whatever. Okay. Um, this has been awesome. I enjoged it. All right. Thank you very much. Can we get much. the guy to turn this thing off? Yeah, I think we just... <laughs>